Christ, good night. 
to stay up here. Uh, Sharon's uh, Irwin that comes sometimes, her husband, I was preaching at North Shelby. Uh, search committee from Odenville Baptist Church was coming to hear me. This is in probably about 2003, maybe, or two. Anyway, he was didn't want us to leave North Shelby, and so he told me after the service, he said, I sat right behind that search committee, and when you got up, I said, well, at least it doesn't look like he's drunk tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not drunk today, but my back is hurting, and I'm having a hard time getting around, so if you see me staggering, that's what it is, just to, uh, so we'll be clear. Uh, I hope you'll be able to come back tonight at 6, we started a new video Bible study uh, Wednesday night looking at being faithful. And it's uh, conducted by Adrian Rogers. You can, it's a free uh, small group study that's on the Love Worth Finding website. And so we will, it's about a, well, it's cut down a little bit, I know, because his sermons are typically about 45 minutes and the, the video part we watch will be about 25 minutes. So I know they've done a little editing. So come tonight, we'll watch the video and have a time of discussion. And there's, there's seven different lessons in this particular um, study. And then there's several more that are on their website that we're planning on using. Um, over the next several weeks. I hope you'll be able to come for that on Sunday night and Wednesday night at 6. The uh, devotional magazines, the Open Windows and the Ladies Journal, is that what it's called? Journey. Journey. Uh, are in the back for September or for the fall, I guess, quarter. Uh, September, October, November, if that scares you any. Uh, so you be sure and pick up one or more of those as you leave there in the back. And with that in mind, um, September is the start of what we used to call in the old days the Sunday school quarter. And that's the, the first Sunday in September is when we'll have the Lord's Supper. So uh, it'll be a few weeks out, but just keep that in mind. And then we'll have a business meeting the second Sunday, I guess, in September. All right. I think that's all I know. Anybody else have an announcement? All right. If you're not sick or staggering and want to stand up and greet each other, you can do that. <laughs>
thank you. Making your way back to your seat, starting at number 522, we'll sing all three verses. <laughs> Jesus is always in the present tense. 
God is always in the present tense. God told Moses, my name is I am. That's always in the present tense. I am. Not I was, not I were, not I used to be, but I am. And Jesus is always mentioned in the present tense, except in the book of Revelation. And John sees a vision of Jesus, and Jesus says to John, I am he that was dead. I used to be dead, but now I'm alive, and now that I'm alive, I'm alive forevermore. And so Jesus is the first fruit, and we're the promise to come later. And then Paul says, if it's really true, then it ought to make a difference in the way we live. We ought to be making a difference in the lives of other people because we believe in the resurrection and we look for that hope of the resurrection because he says, there's some people that don't know God and we need to share it with them. And so we come today to verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another of the glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening or life-giving spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such, all, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time in your house. Thank you for each one that's come this way. We pray, Lord, that this morning that you would help us to see Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Paul asked a question. We don't know if this was a specific question that the Corinthians had written to him or Paul's just surmising because I've told you about the resurrection and because some of you don't believe the resurrection anyway, some of you or somebody is going to ask, okay, Paul, if there is really a resurrection and if it's really, really a bodily resurrection, how's it going to happen? How are the dead going to be raised? And if it is a bodily resurrection, what kind of body are they going to have? And so in verses 36 through 50, Paul seeks to answer that question. And he starts it out not the way they teach you in, um, in school to answer a question. <laughs> Paul answers their question with, you foolish person. You don't know what you're talking about. And then he gives us 
some examples. First, uh, an illustration, a comparison of the resurrection. And I guess I'm a little denser than some. This really spoke to me in a way that I've never seen it before. So I hope it will, uh, you'll probably say, well, I've always known that. But anyway, really spoke to me. First, he gives an illustration in the world of agriculture. Paul says, you're foolish because we have these differences all around us. We have a resurrection, a picture of a resurrection anyway. When you plant something, and no illustration is perfect and you can't force it uh, in here, but the illustration is of planting something. When you plant a garden or when you plant anything, what you plant is not what you get back. And that always worried me because when I was a kid, we used to plant corn. We even, Daddy bought a double at an old antique shop. Daddy bought a mule pulled corn planter. Had a little tin bucket on top of it. And as it went along, it clicked and knocked a kernel of corn out and the little wheel had a wheel on the back and as the mule pulled it, it would knock corn out and cover it back up when it did. And this verse always bothered me because the corn we planted looked like the corn that came up. I mean, you planted a kernel of corn. Now I know you got back stalk of corn that had a bunch of ears on it, but it always bothered me because the what I planted looked like what came up, and that bothered me with this passage of Scripture. But the light that finally came on, it does look like that, but it's not what you planted. The one you planted died. That little kernel of corn that we planted had to die and deteriorate and out of it came a new plant. Now it was like that old plant. It looked like that old plant. It looked like that little kernel of corn. But it wasn't that kernel of corn. It was something new. Now to make the illustration a little better. In a few months. I guess about October, November I think is when you do it. You may go out in your yard and take a little ball. And you may dig a little hole and stick that ball down in it and cover it back up. My mama used to do that. And about February, something that didn't look anything like that little ball she stuck in the ground. A beautiful, either a, a hyacinth I used to love. It made the whole yard smell. But out of that ugly little bulb that you planted, this beautiful flower would grow. And it didn't look anything like what you planted. And that's what Paul says. There is a difference in what you plant and what you get back. Jesus said of his own resurrection, of his own death, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it can't grow. It can't come back. But if it dies, it can bring forth much fruit. And so he goes on to say we're not to love our life here, but we're to give our life that it can bring life to others. So there's a difference. There's an illustration in the agriculture world. There's a difference in the animal world, and that includes us. I don't usually like to think of humans as animals in the way that the evolutionist does that we're all just animals headed up but we're all part of the animal world if you will there's different kinds of flesh Paul says different types of well we're different humanly and I'm going to try to be as delicate as I can here have you ever noticed how different people are. I mean, even 
brothers and sisters that don't look anything alike, that are shaped different and size different. I know in my family, my older brother, if y'all, some of you will remember this uh, back from the old Sears days when we used to get all of our clothes that lasted longer than the boys did. My brother was a, uh, what they call it? Slim. A slim. My brother was a slim. My young, older brother was a slim. My younger brother was a regular. Guess where I was in the middle? I was a husky. That's what the size used to be. A husky. And we were all different sizes. We were all different shapes. We liked different things. I joked with my brothers and their wives one Christmas. My older brother is, is a PhD in engineering. My younger brother has a master's degree in music and theater. He teaches at Liberty University. So I was having a little fun with, their, with them and their wives. I said, my, my older brother got all the brains. My younger brother got all the talent. And that didn't leave me anything but the looks. So um, we're all different. There's different kinds of flesh, of people, of animals, of fish. I like a piece of fish to eat. And I love most every kind of fish. But I can't stand, and it's a fish just like these other fish, but I can't stand. Stand, and if you do, that's okay. I can't stand one of these fish steaks. It's a piece of fish, but it chews like a piece of beef. I just can't stand that. There's different kinds of flesh. And Paul's going to go on to tell us how this goes in our uh, when we're changed. People are different. Thirdly, they're the illustration is of planets, uh, stars, of astrological bodies. There's the sun, there's the moon, there's the stars, and they're all different. And I looked up a little bit of this, and I couldn't understand it enough to tell you what they are. But if you look at the different uh, websites and the physics and the astrophysics and the astrologers they can tell you about the carbon and the hydrogen and the atoms and all this sort of stuff and some stars are made up of this and some stars are made up of that and they're all different and Paul says that's an illustration of the resurrection there's so many differences that Paul secondly not doesn't just talk about the comparison, but the contrast, they're all different. And the body that we bury, the body that dies, is different from the one that will be raised. And Paul makes the comparison here. Our natural body, if you will, our natural body is corrupt. And our new body, our resurrection body, will be incorruptible. It won't be perishable. Our bodies are dust. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, we all go to one place, whether you're rich or poor, whether you have a lot or a little. When we, unfortunately, or when I've been out here or other places to have a funeral, no matter who it is, the grave comes in one size. And the writer of Ecclesiastes says we all will turn to dust again. The psalmist says in Psalm 103, He, God, knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. And our days are like grass and the flower of the field. They last for a little time, but the wind blows and they're gone. Valerie was showing me some pictures of some trees at her place that were big, huge trees, and they're there one minute, and the wind blows, and they're gone. 
And that's the way we are. We are dust. I used to see this program some on PBS. It's been dead for several years, but Carl Sagan was a physicist, astronomer. I don't know all the titles. Anyway, he was a brilliant man. But I think wrong on a lot of issues um, because he believed the, the cosmos was just a product of chance, that it all just happened. But it's amazing some of the things that he talked about, how well they fit in with the Bible. And, well, a different way, I guess. One of the things we've noticed is that our bodies are made up of this same cosmic dust called star stuff. And all I can think of, that's in the second chapter. I mean, you didn't have to go to the second chapter to get that. The Bible says that God took the dust of the ground and formed a man. And we're corruptible. We get sick. We break down. God told Adam, because you sinned, you came from the dust, and one day you'll go back to the dust. But Paul says, our new bodies are not like that. Peter says, we have a hope in Christ, a living hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we don't have a corruptible inheritance, but an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled, that fades not away, that can't be done away with. Paul will say later in this 15th chapter, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. Our bodies now are corruptible. Our new bodies will be incorruptible. And again, he's not going to tell us exactly what it's going to be like, because we don't know what it's going to be like. But it will be incorruptible. Secondly, it'll be our bodies now are sown or buried in dishonor and we'll be raised in glory. The word dishonor means shame or vileness. Paul uses this word in Romans 1, which sounds like you're reading out of the newspaper today. He talks about when, when people know who God is, they don't recognize him as God, and because they don't recognize him as God, they're not thankful they get into all kinds of stuff, and it's the kind of stuff that we're in today. And Paul says God will give them up to vile affections, and that's where we are today. We love stuff we ought to hate. We hate stuff we ought to love. We have the capacity, somebody has said, man is the only animal that has the capacity to blush, and he's the only one that needs to. We, well, Vance Abner used to say, I used to say that civilization was going to the dogs, but I've quit that out of respect for dogs. We're doing things worse than the animals do. We have the capacity for corruption, for self-gratification, and not just in the grossest sins that we would think about, but in food, in pleasure, in fun, when we put those things in front of God. We use the expression, or some people I've heard use this expression, I owe it to myself to be happy. Well, if you're a Christian, you owe it to God to be holy. And that's what God's called us to be. And one day we will be raised in glory. We talked about this morning in Ezekiel. Those wheels and the light and the fire that reflect the glory of God. And one day we'll reflect perfectly. We're supposed to be, Paul says, changed now from glory to glory. But one day we'll perfectly reflect his glory. Paul says he'll change our vile body 
into one like his glorious body. So, Paul compares or contrasts corruption and incorruption, dishonor and glory, weakness and power. The human body is weak. Now, we see people sometimes who are very strong, especially we see today uh, people who are athletic, people who can throw a baseball 100 miles an hour, people who can throw a football 70 or 80 yards. And you see these people, and I remember uh, going by Briarwood High School one day to look at something, and the football team was coming out to practice, and uh, Tim Castile at the time was playing for Briarwood. And man, that was back when the Under Armour stuff was real big. And he came out of there, and he looked like a man among boys, to tell you the truth. He was a specimen. He was strong and, um, you know, looked like he could do anything. But it's amazing to me to see these huge, strong, athletic, people get out on the football field and it looked like they could just run forever and play forever and do all this stuff and one little twist of their ankle and somebody has to come out there as Andy Griffith says and get a stretcher as soon as they bring him off they run another one out there and they can't play anymore some of them forever and as we saw during the pandemic, there were people, I'm sure that you knew of, who were perfectly healthy and they got sick and just in a matter of weeks, some even died. It's amazing how weak our bodies are. We can go from being very healthy to very weak or sick in just minutes, it seems. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. The only thing we have to go by is the example of Christ's resurrected body. He could be in a place where the disciples were. He could be, Luke tells us, or John tells us, the disciples could be in a room with the doors locked, and he could just show up in the middle of the room. He could be with the two on the road to Emmaus, and they invited him to come in and he disappeared out of their sight. I think moving at a rate that human eye couldn't see. He could be here and be there and he could move and yet he could still eat and they could recognize him for who he was. It is a powerful body. He could meet Mary at the tomb and then meet the women on the way back to tell the disciples and then meet Peter and then meet the two on the road to Emmaus. He had a powerful body. So corruption versus incorruption, dishonor versus glory, weakness versus power and natural versus spiritual. Our bodies are made, as we talked about before, of the dust. We have a natural body. We're made from the earth, from the dust. We're made to live here on earth. But we live in a fallen world full of sin and sickness and suffering. And our bodies are not made to live in the next world. Jesus said that the next world's not going to be anything like this. All the things that we think about that are important to us now, we won't even think about those there. It'll be so different. We don't know again exactly what we'll be like, but John tells us that we'll be like him. We'll be like Jesus. So, Paul makes a comparison and a contrast and then gives us the chronology. We will 
we don't get is Opie wanted to do. Aunt B told him, make sure you eat your sandwich first and not the apple pie first. And Opie said, why is that? If I get full, I'd rather get full having had the pie than having the sandwich. And he, she said, that's why I want you to eat the sandwich first. Well, to use that application, we have to have the sandwich first. Paul says we have the earthy first. We have the natural body first. God, in Genesis 2, God formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and Paul says he became a living soul. And that's what the Bible says in Genesis. God breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And because of sin, we will return to that dust one day. We have an earthy body that is going to disappear. It'll be like that grain of wheat or corn that's planted in the ground and it'll go away. It'll dissolve. But we will have a new body. We're like Adam. We talk about being created in the image of God and we are to a certain extent. But the Bible says that God created Adam in his image. And in Genesis chapter 5, it says these are the generations of Adam. Adam lived how many ever years? And he had children. And the children he had, they were, uh, he lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image. And so, in a real sense, we're made after Adam. We're made with a corruptible nature and a body that will ultimately die. Paul says, as we've already looked at, 1 Corinthians 15, in Adam all die. If we're born, we're subject to death. But the good news is if you're in Christ, Paul says in that same verse, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul tells us about that in Romans 5. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. If you're in Adam, you'll die. And everybody that came in Adam's line died. But then Christ came, that much more chapter in in uh, Romans chapter 5 that we have much more in Christ and because we have much more in Christ in the same way that Adam's disobedience brought sin Christ's sacrifice and resurrection brings life and we can have that life in him if we're in Christ and we'll be like him. Jesus says in Matthew 13, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. We'll be changed because verse 50 says, Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not made for heaven because I couldn't see what heaven's like. I couldn't live in heaven. I couldn't be in the presence of God in my present condition. I'm going to have to be changed. And Paul says that's what will happen. How are the dead raised? And what bodies will they have? Well, Paul says it's like a seed. That seed that you plant is not the seed you get back. It, it looks like that. It has some of the same characteristics as that seed does. It's like that seed enough for you to recognize it, but it's different. And if I can just throw in right here, I'm not for this or against this, I just will tell you. If you want to be cremated, you can be cremated. It always, it's a testimony that we believe there is a resurrection. You ever notice in most cemeteries, the 
the graves are all pointed toward the east. Did you ever notice that before? They're pointed east so that, well, I think it's a testimony that the Bible talks about the eastern sky or Christ coming from the east. Almost as if we had to help God out and turn the graves in the right direction, you know, so we could be sure and get them. Some people question, oh, if you're cremated, how's God going to put your body back together? Well, um, if he can create the first man, he can create you, and you're not going to get that body back anyway. It's going to look like that body. It'll be enough like that body that people will recognize you, but praise the Lord, it won't be this body. If I can just make a very practical illustration, your back won't hurt. You won't have to go on a diet. It'll be a supernatural body. It'll be like that body that was planted, but it'll be oh so different. It'll be glorious, just as there are all different kinds of bodies in, the, in space, celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, those on the earth will be that much different in that new body that we will get in corruption and glory and power and supernatural. But first, we have to live here. And we live here until Christ either calls us home or till we die and we go to be with him. And we'll talk about next time how God will change us whether we die or whether we meet him in the air. Paul says we won't all die, we won't all sleep, but we'll all be changed and have that glorious body. I couldn't help but think of a sort of a homely illustration. We had some friends from England that used to come here and visit us some. They were teachers and so their holiday they got in England was in August. And so they would come here and visit Alabama in August. Well, if you watched any of the British Open golf tournament the last month or so, you saw that in June and July, they're wearing coats and toboggans and the wind's blowing and it's cold. Well, they came here in August, and it's like it is now. And we took them to the zoo, we took them to the botanical gardens, and they just wilted. They were not used to Alabama in August. They were used to England in August when it feels like fall here in the middle of summertime. That's the, on a very small scale, that's the difference. We can't be in heaven in the body we got. We're not used to that. We can't function in that environment. Paul says we're going to have to be changed. And the change is more than we can imagine. More than the what you plant to what you grow. More than the differences between all of us. More than the differences between the stars and the planets. It'll be totally different. A supernatural body that we can be in God's presence and live and serve and glorify Him forever. And the only way for us to have that body is to be in Christ. And the only way to be in Christ is to receive Him as Lord and Savior. Paul says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And whoever does that will be saved. If you don't know Christ, would you come to him and be ready for that new body that we'll receive one day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the promise of the resurrection that we'll be changed from these weak corruptible, perishable, sometimes vile bodies into a glorious body like your body so that we can worship you and praise you and serve you, reflect your glory forever.
Lord, I pray that there's one that doesn't know you, that today would be the day that they would say yes to you, to receive you as Lord and Savior. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have our hymn of invitation. Would you come as we stand and sing? Number 283.